For this week's video, we'll be examining the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, which was just published in the United States in December of 2019 by Image. It comes in a hardback. It's the study edition. We'll take a look at, we'll take a look at the back here. to get the reflections off so you can read this if you want. Here is the ISBN and it says that it carries a uh, Niall Abstat, an imprimatur from the Catholic Bishops Conference of England and Wales. We look inside the flap. The back flap tells you who designed the uh, jacket, and I think it's very attractive, imagecatholicbooks.com. It's a Pen Penguin Random House book. Look inside the front flap, and it calls itself a beautifully fully updated edition of the New Jerusalem Bible. Tells you who's responsible, Dom Henry Wandsbro. Most up to date developments and scholarship. I'm going to take that off to make it easier to manipulate things during the video. Dimensionally, this book is just over nine and a half inches, inches tall, six and a quarter inches wide, and it's two and three eighths inch thick. This sort of shape is common for single column Bibles because the human eye really can't track very, very far across the page, so they have to make the page relatively narrow. Here it is compared with the New Testament alone, which was published almost two years ago or thereabouts. I did my review of it about two years ago. The full Bible is much larger, but the paper here is much thicker than here, so that's why this thing is not a whole lot thinner. Here it is compared with the Didache Bible. At least my copy of the Didache Bible is just a bit shorter and it's not quite as thick. About the same width. And finally, this is the new, um, the original Jerusalem Bible. So the one on top is two generations more recent than the one on the bottom. Roughly the same height and the same width. The original Jerusalem Bible is somewhat thicker. I might mention the one text column. So here it is. It's 107 millimeters wide. There are as many as 80 characters per line and as many as 48 lines of text on a page. Page dimensions are 234 millimeters tall, 150 millimeters wide, so that's 9.2 inches tall, 5.9 inches wide. The margins move around a bit at the top, from the top of the capitals and the top line to the edge is between 19 and 22 millimeters at the bottom, from the bottom of a descender on the bottom line of notes to the edge is um, 24 to 28 millimeters, so that's around an inch. The inner margin can be as much as 19 millimeters, and the outer is between 20 and 22 millimeters. The font here in the text is about a 10 point font. I measure the line height at 3.91 millimeters, that's about 11 points. It is fairly generous. It's easy on the eye that kind of a line height. Verse numbers, as you see, are alongside the paragraph, and the verses are separated by this dot placed in the text. The text is often, but not always, line matched. And I will attempt to show that to you here. Let's zoom in a bit. So on this page, let's see what we have. It appears here that it is line matched on this page, because the text is coming straight down from there. 
Look at the next page over. It appears to be line matched as well. And in this page as well. Line matched. And yet here. You look at this page. This page is fairly clearly not line matched. Let's see if we can give some assistance in that. And so you can see the text from the opposite page is going in between the lines and not along them. It's kind of curious. It's generally line matched, but not always. The uh, text added by the editors is not in italic font. You will find italic font in this Bible in the New Testament particularly, but that's for quotations from the old. There are page bottom notes in two columns. The font down here is about seven and a half points and the column width is 53 millimeters. These notes are essentially the same as those in this Bible, the CTS New Catholic Bible. And if we look at the same place, essentially we'll see notes on lepton, this incident and that of verse four, Luke converts the innocent, the incident of Mark 11. And if we look here, see the same notes essentially. Lepton, this is incident and that of verse four. Luke converts the incident of Mark 11, 12 to 14, etc. So essentially the same notes as are in the CTS New Catholic Bible. The paper is um, fairly thick, 43 mi microns thick. My, I estimate the paper weight at 39 GSM. There is a pattern glossiness on this paper. Paper is um, a slight beige tinge, and there is only moderate show through. We'll show this show through in a minute, but first I'm gonna try to give you a sense for the pattern glossiness here. I think you can see it particularly right through here. There's a, a waxiness to the paper that does make it somewhat difficult to read. You really have to be concerned about your angles. Let's look for the show through and see if I can show you that. So here's forward coming through. You can see it's fairly well attenuated. There's the D. You can definitely make it out, but it does attenuate fairly well. So the major problem I have with this paper is the kind of blotchy waxiness that covers it. There is some print non-uniformity and it's fairly significant. And the common I'll show you that here by showing you pages 25 and 27 simultaneously. 27 on the right, 25 on the left. Do you get that kind of variation fairly commonly in this Bible. Um, there are book introductions in some of the books, some of the books not. We'll, we'll determine which ones when we look at the table of contents later. Here's the introduction to Genesis. It is in a 10.5 point font, so it's a bit larger than the text in the Bible itself. 107 millimeter wide column, about 74 characters per line. The uh, book titles are in center top. It would be better to have them out to the outside you can so that you can find your way from book to book more easily. But in a book that's this narrow, having them in the center is not a serious impediment. Page contents are the outside top here. So 2633 in Genesis is the last verse here on this page. You can see that's 33 there. And 2527 is the first verse on this page. There's verse 27. Page numbers are outside bottom of the page. Headings are in the text and there are about 10.5 points and quite large bold letters. Chapter numbers are also large and bold at the beginning of the chapter. So instead of giving the first verse number, they give the chapter number here. 
books do begin on a separate page. Let's look at the end. And I'll show you that. With some of the smaller books. There's the introduction to Jude. Followed by Jude. There's 3rd John, separated from 2nd John by a blank piece of paper, which is separated from 1st John by a blank piece of paper. So all of these books um, begin on a separate page. Quotations from the Old Testament are, as I mentioned earlier, in an italic font. So let's go to Romans chapter 3, where quotations are fairly abundant. Here in 2.24, you see a quotation from Isaiah 52.5 and or Ezekiel 36.20. And it is not separately indented, but the string of quotations from chapter 3 nearby is. I think you're seeing some of the pattern glossiness through here and through here. So the sources of the quotation, as we see, are given in the margins and the words of Christ. If you go back to the Gospels, the words of Christ are in black throughout, which I definitely prefer. So here are some of the Beatitudes spoken by our Lord in black letters, which makes it, uh, to my mind, much easier to read, much easier on the eye, less eye strain, and it's also easier for the printers. At the end of the book of Revelation, which is on the left, again you're seeing the shine, I think, you come to a page that introduces the study materials. Those began with an index to the notes, which is in two columns. It's about 12 pages long, and it's in a 9.5 point font. So this tells you how to find these major themes that are addressed in the notes. to the end of that we see a chronological table. It's about 10 pages long in the same 9.5 point font. After the chronological table we come to an index of persons. Two columns, 10 pages, same font again. And after the index of persons we come to the index of maps. And it's to the maps. So it tells you the map, map number and then the grid coordinates to find this particular place for each of the maps. Eight pages, nine and a half point font. At the end are seven relatively low detail, glossy. You can see the shine there. Glossy maps. Glossy, glossy maps don't bother me, but some people like to write in ink on maps, so the glossiness can cause them trouble because the ink will smear. They do not go in the gutter. They're definitely colorful, and they do show topographic features, but they do not show a lot of detail. You can see the paucity of place names here on this map. And that's the final one. It is a glued hardback, so it's a typical hardback cover, but it is glued. I think you should be able to see here the line of glue that goes across. Another way to tell that you have a glued um, book rather than a sewn one is to look for signatures. I'll show you the uh, spine of the Jerusalem Bible. And I think you can see the clearly defined signatures here. There's groups of pages gathered together. You do not see that here in this glued hardback. Still another thing to look for is this kind of pattern that I'm about to show you here in the gutter. You see that? That looks like close stitching. That is an indication that you have a glued hardback. You see that rather than a few evenly spaced stitch marks. If you find this sort of a ribbed feature in the gutter, 
that's a sign of, of a glued book. It has, as we saw uh, when we were looking at the glue line, uh, orange head and tail bands. There are no ribbon markers. It lies open because the hinge is very flexible. It lies open relatively easy in Genesis. Good look at the sheen there. And uh, in, in Revelation and then the study notes at the back, so it will lie open there. The text does tend to fall off into the gutter, so you have to manipulate the Bible to keep it flat on the page that you're reading. If I want to read the left, I push it down that way. If I want to read it on the right page, I push it up like that. In the front, we have a half leaf, a normal title page, copyright page, copyright 2019, Darton, Longman, and Todd, image books, uh, the Psalms are from the Revised Grail Psalms, copyright 2010, so they do not have their own separate Psalms. Uh, the Nile Obstat is from this gentleman, and the Imprimatur is from that person. Um, they are not a declaration that a book or pamphlet is considered to be free from doctrinal or moral error. And I will show you a bit later what I think is a doctrinal error from a Roman Catholic point of view in this Bible. First printing, the first U.S. edition. We saw the ISBNs earlier. And a word of gratitude to some individuals. Table of Contents. So it has the books in the normal Catholic order. In italic font here you see um, introductions. So there's an introduction to the Pentateuch, and then there are introductions to these books. There's a single introduction to the books of Samuel, but not a separate introduction to each of those books. And similarly for Kings and Chronicles, and for Ezra and Nehemiah. But there is an introduction to Tobit, as if, if I recall correctly. So there's a certain amount of inconsistency there. Uh, the New Testament books, and then the study materials in the back, which we have seen. So the entire text of the Bible takes you to page 2358. After the contents, we come to the foreword. I'd like to make a couple of points about the foreword. Uh, the second sentence says that the uh, Jerusalem Bible was the first full translation of the Bible into modern English. Now, I think what one needs to understand when you're reading that is that the author is thinking about Roman Catholic Bibles with all of the deuterocanonical books, because quite clearly you have uh, other translations like uh, this one, the American translation of the Old Testament and New Testament, and it was uh, this is a later edition of it, from 1935, I think it first came out in 1931, but it does not include the deuterocanonical books. You see something similar that may puzzle you at first, farther down the page, where it says that after the publication of the Jerusalem Bible, other modern translations began to appear, such as the Revised Standard Version. Um, the Revised Standard Version, of course, was published first in 1952, 14 years before the Jerusalem Bible. But again, I think the author must be thinking about a Bible that includes all of the Roman Catholic canon. Another curious thing about this uh, that I think is actually incorrect is that higher up on the page, just a bit, it says, until then, until the Jerusalem Bible was was published. The Jerusalem Bible was the large red one that I showed you just a moment ago when we were looking at glued versus sewn bindings. Until that was published, a fully annotated Bible had not been part of the English biblical tradition. Well, the, uh, the author of the foreword may be unaware of the uh, Dewey Reims Bible, which has many more annotations in terms of word count. As mu it's much better annotated than this revised New Jerusalem Bible study edition is.
Continuing in the preface, uh, there's a paragraph that talks about the New Jerusalem Bible of 1985, which uh, I reviewed some time back. Then it mentions um, the CTS New Catholic Bible, which we showed just a moment ago, that very small hardback, and the fact that this Bible contains the notes from the CTS New Catholic Bible. They are rather uh, shorter, less detailed than those from the original Jerusalem Bible. Here in this translation, attention has been given to rendering the language and imagery of the original languages accurately rather than by dynamic equivalents. The original Jerusalem Bible is a very free translation. This translation, as you'll see in a moment when I show you my translation continuum chart, is, um, is much more word for word, not quite as word for word as, say, a revised standard version, but more so than the new international version. And then every attempt has been made to show the message of the Bible is directed to men and women equally, despite the inbuilt bias of the English language. Well, that's questionable, whether there's a bias in the English language. Uh, the fact that um, masculine-sounding pronouns are used sometimes for both men and women doesn't strike me as a bias. Here we uh, talk about the um, notes. Key references should not be drowned by reference to less important allusions. So there are far few side margin references here than in the original Jerusalem Bible or the New Jerusalem Bible, which I think is unfortunate. Um, they make they put uh, measures in modern metric equivalents, so they do not have a table of weights and measures. Uh, they talk about the New Grail Psalter, which is used here and the fact that although the earlier Jerusalem Bibles used Yahweh, um, they use the Lord here, and this portion of the, the uh, foreword gives an explanation for that. And the foreword is by Henry Wansbro from Apple, Ampleforth Abbey, York, June of this, this year, which is almost over. After the foreword is a preface, which talks about uh, the use of italics for quotations from the Old Testament, marginal references, and then we have abbreviations in the notes and references at the bottom of the page, and then abbreviations for the books of the Bible. Here's another look at the show through, the attenuation that this page the paper provides you, which is rather strong. It's good attenuation good opaque paper, or abbreviations, the Old Testament, a very brief introduction to the Pentateuch, and then the introduction to Genesis. And it talks about the uh, JEDP hypothesis, and the date of composi composition, and then you're at the beginning of the book of Genesis. So now I'm showing you the font relatively close up. And as we talked about earlier, it's pretty clear that the line spacing is very good. It's very easy on the eye. I do not have any problem with the characters, the way they track, or the way the words are spaced either. I think it's very well done. Now we're going to try to bring over the original Jerusalem Bible so that we can compare the font and printing on those two. There's quite a lot of margin there, so it makes it difficult. But I think you'll agree with me that the printing is darker and bolder and easier to read on the original Jerusalem Bible than it is in the revised New Jerusalem Bible on the left. If you have the paperback New Testament and you're not really interested in getting the Old Testament, then you may just want to retain it because it's shown here on the right it has whiter paper, less show through. Uh, the font is smaller on the right than it is on the left, however. On the right now I have the uh, CTS New Catholic Bible. This is the compact edition. And as you can tell, the uh, the font there is very, very small. 
uh, but it is printed nice, uh, nice and darkly and very crisply as well. As a final font comparison, I have brought in my copy of the Didache Bible, which is in the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition. And um, I must say, I think I, it's a bit larger on the right and a bolder print. Both it, my copy here of the of the Didache Bible and this Revised New Jerusalem Bible suffer from having waxy paper, but the Didache Bible has the advantage of having a bolder print. Unfortunately, the Didache Bible does not include the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition, textual and translation notes, which is really a shame. We saw in the foreword that uh, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible has fewer references than the previous editions of the Jerusalem Bible. So here is an example at Proverbs 3.34. He mocks those who mock, but grants his favor to the humble. There are no marginal references at all. But if you look back at the original Jerusalem Bible, he mocks those who mock but accords his favor to the humble. You'll see references there in the margin to James 4.6 and 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Similarly, here in Isaiah 52.5, uh, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible says, My name is held in contempt all day, every day, and there is no marginal note. But in the original Jerusalem Bible, zoom out a bit so you can see it, 52.5 had all day long my name is blasphemed constantly blasphemed and in the margin you have a reference to Romans 2.24 where it's quoted well I haven't had a lot of time to review the uh, Old Testament in this revised New Jerusalem Bible but if it's similar to the New Testament in, in, in style then I think it's uh, refreshing compared to say uh, many of the translations that are sort of prosaic, it will use um, words, uh, has a voc richness of vocabulary that's absent in many modern translations. Um, one thing I have noticed is that it does depart from the Masoretic text from time to time, and I'll show you a few examples. Here it does so by including the words, let us go out. The Mas Masoretic text says something like, uh, Cain uh, spoke to his brother Abel and while they were in the open country. You can um, realize that this is this phrase, let us go out, is not in the Masoretic text if you have uh, the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition, which has the words, let us go out to the field, and a footnote H, and the footnote H then says, this is from the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Greek, the Syriac, and something similar is in the Vulgate. The Hebrew lacks, let us go out to the field. It would have been nice if the Revised New Jerusalem Bible had included a footnote like that. I hope by showing you these examples you'll be able to read sections of the Revised New Jerusalem Bible Old Testament and decide how well you like it or not. Um, this example of a departure from the Masoretic text is here. Uh, he made the people his serfs to work for him. The Hebrew Bible actually says something different. And again, the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition, has a footnote here at 20 through 21 that tells you um, where it translates, he made slaves of them from one end of Egypt to the other. If we go down to the footnote, it points out that the Hebrew actually reads, he removed them to the cities. Again, it would have been nice to have had in the study edition a note explaining that the Revised New Jerusalem Bible was departing from the Masoretic text. Here in Psalm 145, the 13th verse, we do see an addition from the Septuagint, I believe from the Greek and the in Dead Sea Scrolls, this portion that's uh, headed by this word, Enun. Uh, the Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his deeds. You'll see uh, the raised superscript A, and if you go to the bottom of the page, you'll see a note 
that says that this verse is lacking in the standard Hebrew text, but is supplied from the Greek and Qumran texts. It's very good that they put a note here this time. I wish they had done it more consistently. Well, I'm sorry to have to say that some of the notes seem to have been written from a spirit of unbelief. So there's a note here on the fourth song of the servant of the Lord, superscript A. I'll um, pan down the page slowly so that you can read Isaiah 53 if you like. And we'll get down to the note. And the note itself acknowledges that this song of the servant has been important to Christians from the beginning um, and that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures and this and Psalm 22 have been seen as those scriptures. Nevertheless, that means what was went before is not correct. Nevertheless, its primary meaning is in the context of the book, another poetic reflection on the Lord's restoration of Israel after the suffering of the servant nation. So the servant's suffering servant is the nation of Israel, according to the note, and not Jesus the Messiah. In the 22nd Psalm, there's a passage that traditionally has been interpreted by Christians as having reference to the crucifixion of the Lord. Dogs have surrounded me, a band of tormentors all around me. They tear holes in my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones. They stare at me at gloat. They divide my clothing among them and casting lots for my robe. Um, there's no note here at all in the Revised New Jerusalem Bible, but if you have a copy of the Didache Bible, you'll find some quite orthodox, lower O orthodox words here in reference to this portion of the psalm. Psalm 40 verse 7 reads, You delight not in sacrifice and offerings, but in an open ear. You do not ask for holocaust and victim. Now here at least we have a footnote, footnote B, which we will scan down to, and footnote B acknowledges that there is a messianic interpretation of this based on the Septuagint reading, you shaped a body for me. I was pleased to see that they used the word virgin in the translation, like the virgin is with child and will give birth to a son whom she will call Emmanuel, here in Isaiah 7.14. But the footnote below indicates that the young woman uh, isn't Mary, it's uh, either the wife of the prophet or of the king. They do make mention of the messianic character of this, which relies upon the Septuagint's translation of the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew word Alma as virgin, which allows Matthew to apply it to Jesus. But the sense you get reading the uh, annotation is that it actually doesn't apply to Jesus, but rather to one of these two people. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it reads, they will mourn for the one whom they have pierced, as though for an only child, and weep for him as people weep for a firstborn child. And there are references to indicate that this verse is used in John 19.37 and in Revelation 1.7. as referring to Jesus when you look at those verses. But if you read the note down below, there is in no indication, explicitly at least, that the editors think it has to do with a messianic prophecy. Sometimes the uh, footnotes don't seem to match the text in the Bible. So here at the end of verse 15 in Genesis chapter 3, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible says, He will bruise your head and you will strike his heel. Notice that it has he. If you look at the footnote that is attached to it, it makes a distinction between the Greek's masculine pronoun he and it. And use of he, it says, suggests that a particular person rather than her progeny in general is in view. But um, it's not clearer than why they brought up it. But you realize the point of the note when you look at the original Jerusalem Bible text, which read, it will crush your head and you will strike its heel. And then if you look at the note there, it explains that uh, he is in the Greek. Another example happens here toward the end of Daniel chapter 10, where 
the Revised New Jerusalem Bible says, uh, the Prince of Greece will come. Then if you pan down to the note, it says Ionia, standing for Greece as a whole. So why did we need that footnote? Well, it turns out it's useful, um, but only for the original Jerusalem Bible, which had uh, the word Javan, Javan there. Let's see if we can find it in this. There it is. So what does Javan mean? Well, the note tells you that Javan is Ionia, and that stands for Greece as a whole. So that footnote isn't really needed here anymore because we have Greece in the text. The third example of a footnote mismatch with the text occurs here in Revelation chapter 1, where the Revised New Jerusalem Bible reads, It was the Lord's day, and I was in spirit. And there's a footnote, F. So we'll pan down to F. And the footnote says, literally, I was in spirit. Well, that's what we just read, apart from the capital S. And since the capitals aren't reflected in the Greek, it's saying, literally, it says exactly what it says. So why did they give us that note? Well, it turns out that the um, Jerusalem Bible itself read, uh, Spirit possessed me. And so the footnote was saying that literally what this reads is, I was in spirit, not the spirit possessed me. So uh, portions of the note may still be applicable, but that original early portion of it, literally I was in spirit, really doesn't seem to serve here. Sometimes the uh, notes in the Revised New Jerusalem Bible Study Edition are simply just less informative and satisfying than those in the original Jerusalem Bible. Here's a note at the beginning of Esther. That note A will pan down. And note A says that the book of Esther exists in two versions, Hebrew and Greek. Portions which, portions which exist only in the longer Greek version are printed in italics. If we uh, look at the corresponding note in the original Jerusalem Bible, it tells us that the church has accepted those passages in the Greek version not uh, contained in the Hebrew text. They're printed here in italics. St. Jerome put them in an appendix at the end of his Latin translation. I believe that's where they are in the Dewey Reims. We replaced them in their Greek arrangement with the numbering of the Rolf's edition of the Septuagint. I just find that much more informative and interesting to read. Now, here at Romans 5.12, I'm going to show you a footnote that I think is actually Pelagian. Um, the verse reads, Therefore, just as through one man sin came into the world, and through sin death, and thus death, death is spread through the whole human race, insofar as everyone has sinned. This is a curious translation, insofar as that's normally rendered in the lexicons as because. Literally, it's upon which? Upon what? Upon the sin of the one man. Um, but that's not what the footnote here will lead you to believe, and it sort of justifies their translation, I think, if you view this in a Pelagian sense, insofar as is what you want it to say. Only insofar as all people sin do they enter into sol solidarity with Adam. Well, that's not what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. Uh, paragraph 404 says, um, how did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam as one body of one man. By this unity of the human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as all are implicated in Christ's justice. The uh, Solidarity there is a solidarity by nature of being human, not a solidarity, as the note suggests, of doing the same thing that Adam did, that is, by sinning. The whole passage really doesn't make much sense if interpreted that way, because death is a result of sin, and so people who are innocent, by that logic, should never die. 
Certainly um, innocent children, innocent babies should never die. Now I want to show you my translation continuum chart, which uh, shows the results of my examination of the literalness of New Testament translations by looking at 200 verses selected at random. And it shows there the Revised New Jerusalem Bible being somewhat right of center, somewhat less literal than all the translations to its left, but more literal than the New International Version, either the 84 or the 2011 editions, and uh, much more literal than the New Jerusalem Bible of 1985 or the uh, original Jerusalem Bible of 1966. In a recent video, I explained um, my method for characterizing New Testament translations based on their agreement with four different Greek New Testaments. Westcott and Hort, uh, the Nestle Elan 28th edition, the uh, Tyndall House Greek New Testament, and the Robinson Pierpont Byzantine text form. This chart shows where the Revised New Jerusalem Bible stands on the Westcott and Hort spectrum. So compared to other translations, how frequently does it agree with Westcott and Hort? Westcott and Hort could be, trans could be uh, described perhaps as an Alexandrian trans uh, uh, text of the New Testament. So there you see the Revised New Jerusalem Bible agrees about less than 60% of the time with Westcott and Hort. That uh, compares to the Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible. It's fairly close to the same levels. The Revised New Jerusalem Bible agrees with West Cotton Hort more often than the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition or the New American Bible do, and much more often than the Douay Reims Bible or the Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament do. I did the same thing with the Nestle Elan 28th edition. This is the Greek text that's also in the United Bible Society's 5th edition, which is commonly used by translators. Now you'll notice that the preface to the Revised New Jerusalem Bible didn't tell us which Greek New Testament was being translated. And they do differ from the Nestle Elan 28th edition quite a lot. Um, but they agree with it more than the Jerusalem Bible or the New Jerusalem Bible do. They agree with it much less than the New American Bible does, but more often than the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition. So this is all showing a certain amount of independence of the Revised uh, New Jerusalem Bible translators from the Greek New Testament texts. Here I compare it to show it to how it differs from the Douay Reims Bible and the Eastern Orthodox Bible and it does agree with Nestle Elan more often than either of those. Compared with the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, it uh, does not agree with Tyndall House very often, less than 50% of the time. And compared with Robinson Pierpont's Byzantine text form, the Byzantine text would be that which was used in the later uh, Byzantine Empire. It agrees with that text uh, far less often than, say, the Eastern Orthodox Bible New Testament does. The Revised New Jerusalem Bible differs from the Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible in a number of places in the New Testament based on the source text that they're following. Here is a chart that shows a number of cases where that's true. Now, none of these is um, particularly significant but they do show that a different source text is being translated in all of these instances. When we took a look at the preface, we saw that uh, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible intends to use uh, so-called gender-inclusive language. And here's an example of that in Revelation 3, 20 through 21. Look, I am standing at the door knocking. Um, on this chart, you'll see that I have the Revised New Jerusalem Bible on the left and the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition on the right, and I highlight some of the key differences. The first one is just uh, that the Revised New Jerusalem Bible is looser than the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition. Anyone is more literal than one of you. Uh, the next one in blue, that person, rather than him, the Greek text reads him. Um, but that person has been substituted for him because uh, in modern English, apparently, he no longer depend uh, 
could mean a male or female depending on context. He always means male. Uh, when I was growing up, it meant male or female depending on the context. When you see the same person there, the next one, that person with me rather than he with me, anyone rather than he, and then the Revised New Jerusalem Bible um, omits the him and I will grant him altogether. It's interesting to compare the Revised New Jerusalem Bible with the original Jerusalem Bible, which also read uh, one of you, but uh, had his meal side by side with him, and then it did have those rather than he later on, but it uh, at least didn't altogether shy away from this offensive uh, masculine sounding pronoun, he, him, his. As a second example, we'll look here at Matthew 16, 25 through 26. Uh, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Again, the chart shows the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition on the right, the Revised New Jerusalem Bible on the left. And um, it's very peculiar. The Revised New Jerusalem Bible leaves out the possessive pronouns altogether in the first sentence. So whoever wants to save life will lose it. But whoever loses life for my sake will find it. So if your goldfish dies for Jesus' sake, you'll find some other kind of life rather than your own life. I mean, it's just so abstract. It's just not at all clear. And it's no longer personal. It no longer, is, it, it, it no longer has a definite meaning for an individual. How does it profit someone to gain the whole world? And forfeit life. Again, it's the person's life. It's not life in general. Life is a general principle. Or what could anyone give in exchange for life? It really does need some sort of a pronoun there to make it uh, more distinct. Now contrast that with the original Jerusalem Bible, which happily used the old gender-inclusive um, masculine-sounding pronoun his. For anyone who wants to save his life will lose it, but anyone who loses his life for my sake will find it. There it's personal, it's individual, it has meaning to us. What then will a man gain if he wins the whole world and ruins his life, or what has a man to offer in exchange for his life? Man. Third example on the theme of gender inclusiveness comes uh, two chapters later in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother does something wrong, go and point out the fault between the two of you alone. Notice it left in the masculine sounding word brother. Um, I've in this chart included the translation from the New Revised Standard Version on the right, which reads, if another member of the church sins against you, and then in the second sentence, if the member listens to you, you have regained that one, which is just extremely awkward. Although the New Revised Standard Version generally is a very, um, very attractive and elegant and graceful translation. Here, in the interest of gender neutrality, it's, it really botched things badly. Um, and the Revised New Jerusalem Bible really reads much better here. So, uh, the moral of the story here, I think, is that the Revised New Jerusalem Bible could be much worse than it is. This observation has nothing to do with gender inclusiveness. Rather, it has to do with a textual consideration. Here in Matthew 21, verse 44, it's omitted by the Revised New Jerusalem Bible. Now, that's not new with the Revised New Jerusalem Bible. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible and New Jerusalem Bible also omitted verse 44. Uh, although, um, West Cotton Hoare, the Nestle Elan 28th edition, the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, and the Robinson Pierpont all include the verse, that is, those textual critics behind those Greek New Testament think it belongs. The uh, note in the Revised New Jerusalem says that some manuscripts add verse 44, but it calls it a gloss dependent on Luke 20, 18. Now it's kind of interesting to me that uh, they do not include verse 44 in the footnote. The Old Jerusalem Bible, which also neglected to include 44 in the text, as you see there, did include it in the footnote. 
He who falls on this stone will be dashed to pieces. Anyone it falls on will be crushed. Well, it's time to sum up. Um, I think I'll do that by uh, first mentioning that if you want to see more about the New Testament of the New Revised Standard Version, that is this book here, I did a review on it in 2018, and it's entitled something like New Translation! Exclamation point, The Revised New Jerusalem Bible, New Testament, and Psalms. You should be able to find that in my video feed. Um, if you're interested in um, learning more about my four-dimensional perspective on uh, Bible translations, um, there's a video on that topic as well, and it was posted in November of 2019. Now, I'd like to contrast this Bible with the original Jerusalem Bible, and frankly, uh, this falls short in almost every category. Um, it is, I think, a, a more literal translation, so that's on the plus side. But uh, in just about every other way, this, this is inferior. This has a glued binding. It has uh, poor print quality. Its print is uneven. It's printed relatively lightly on a shiny, glossy paper. Paper, happily, is relatively opaque but it just doesn't compare to the original Jerusalem Bible, which is sewn, which has um, a opaque paper that is not glossy, and which is printed more darkly. The um, Revised New Jerusalem Bible has uh, gender-inclusive language, which sometimes spoils the translation, as we have seen. The notes in the Revised New Jerusalem Bible are not as extensive as those in the Jerusalem Bible or the New Jerusalem Bible were, and uh, for me that's a disappointment. I preferred the more detailed notes in the earlier editions. There are mismatches between the notes here and uh, the text because the notes were originally designed to be used with uh, the Jerusalem Bible and the um, CTS New Catholic Bible, and they haven't been properly modified in all cases to match with the newer text in the, in the translation itself. The notes in the Revised New Jerusalem Bible are not always orthodox, lower case, lower case O orthodox, and um, they tend to support um, modern critical views of the veracity of the scriptures, and um, they pay less um, attention than they could to the messianic character of the Old Testament. So, um, myself, I think the translation is pretty good. I, I think what I would uh, like to see at some point in the future is a bound, um, a sewn bound text version of this Bible without the uh, notes from the CTS New Catholic Bible in it. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this review of the Revised New Jerusalem Bible Study Edition. If you have, please hit the like button, and uh, remember to su subscribe to the channel if you're so inclined.